If it bleeds, it leads. The famous words of the journalist Eric Pauli, who in 1989 wrote an article for New York Magazine titled, Grins, Gore, and Videotape, The Trouble with Local TV News. It was primarily a critique of mass media sensationalism and the way in which murder and mayhem command such high ratings that they suppress any real news. Ultimately, if it bleeds, it leads, was a statement about our fear of and fascination with violence. Fast forward 30 years to a modern digital age, and if it bleeds, it leads, takes on an even deeper meaning. I'm here today to talk about our changing relationship with violence. And this will be a play in three acts. First, how the internet has created new incentives for violence and new avenues for its perpetration. Second, how social media has made victimization visible, which third, creates an audience who are producers and distributors of violence at the same time. And I will also describe some violence prevention and intervention for a digital age. But first, the prologue. I'm a criminologist, and I've been studying cyber violence for over a decade. I'm also a practitioner. I work with law enforcement and criminal justice to address cyber violence. And in a previous life, I was a middle school teacher, which means I got to see it firsthand almost every day. With research colleagues in Europe and in the United States, I have uh, worked closely to understand cyberbullying. I have analyzed countless YouTube rap videos to understand how gang members broadcast their badness. And I've even built a database of mass shooters to understand how they leak their violent intent online to their peers and to the public. And if I've learned anything about violence in the course of my career, it's that it's difficult to perform. It's not easy. Now, it's beauty in the prose of Cormac McCarthy or in the choreography of Quentin Tarantino implies that it's easy to do. But most of us abstain from violence, and even those of us who don't spend far more time talking about it than actually doing it. The truth is, violence is ugly. It is hard on the givers, it's even harder on the receivers. And that's what makes it hard to do. And if you follow crime statistics, you'll also know that violence generally is in decline. And so that's what makes the rise of cyber violence all the more intriguing. Because right now, if you head over to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, there are literally countless examples of normal, everyday people engaged in violent acts. Acts that in a generation past would have been hidden from public view and perhaps wouldn't have been perpetrated at all. The question, of course, is why? Why, in a digital age of perfect remembering, are people posting deadly and extravagant acts of violence on the internet, knowing that this can and will be held against them as evidence? Well, one answer is, we're watching. For the first time in history, we carry with us at all times a camera. Thanks to our smartphones, we can document our everyday lives in real time. And thanks to social media, there are incentives to do so. 
powerful incentives to live the most intimate moments of our everyday lives in public. Now, a digitally mediated world gives new meaning to William Shakespeare's observation that all the world is a stage and all the men and women merely players. If we see something we like, we post it. If we see something we don't like, we post it. And in the process, our subjective reality becomes objectively quantified by the numbers of likes, retweets, friends and followers that we accumulate. We start to behave as though, should a tree fall in the woods and no one's there to tweet about it, it wouldn't make a sound. It can be addictive living life like this, but it can also be exhausting. The pressures to perform, the need to create a constant stream of content, to keep up with the Joneses, or the Kardashians. The fear of missing out, the need to be the best by being the most talked about and by outdoing itself each time. Well, if it bleeds, it leads. What better way to win the internet than through violence? Violence is clickbait supreme. It has proven display value. Ask any street fighter or street corner youth, and they'll tell you that it's a certified route to status and respect. And because violence is costly to perform, for those with something to prove, it might just be worth the price of admission. And so, this explains why in 2016, a young woman live, screen, live streamed the rape of her 17-year-old friend on Periscope, allegedly because she was, quote, caught up in the likes she was receiving. Or later that same year, during the horrific mass shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, and in subsequent mass shootings since, the assailant has been checking Facebook to make sure that they were going viral, and they were. The internet is the new public square. It turns everyday action into dramatic spectacle. And we can chart the rise of this fame-seeking violence from the advent of the videotape in the 1980s to the reality television and sex tape celebrities of the 1990s through to the modern day influencers who become insta famous online and leverage their newfound celebrity into ad revenue and corporate sponsorships. The internet can turn nobody into somebody very quickly. And for people who feel like the world ignores them or doesn't see them how they wish to be seen, this can be seductive. Because we all want to be confirmed acknowledged, celebrated. Perhaps our deepest need is to be seen. When someone is willing to shoot their own boyfriend from a foot away while he holds a book to his chest in a stunt intended for YouTube and he dies in the act, something is wrong. The internet has also changed what it means to be a victim of violence today. By making us all more accessible and more visible, it has created new forms of victimization, from cyber stalking and harassment, to doxing, to sextortion and revenge porn. Much like with traditional forms of violence, often the victims of these new forms are minorities, women, and the most vulnerable in our society, children, who are held hostage by digital collateral, thrust into the spotlight with or without their consent, and repeatedly, routinely re-victimized every time their initial victimization is replayed, repurposed, and commented on 
online. This overexposure can even create incentives for retaliatory violence simply in an effort to save face. Which brings me to the other actors in these performances, the audience. If a fight breaks out on a school playground, invariably it attracts an audience. But if you film that fight and post it on YouTube, now the audience knows no bounds. And more than passive spectators, they can interact with the violence, help it reach new audiences. This is audience participation 2.0. This proximity to violence has other implications. Forced to watch unedited, unpredictable, at times horrific acts of violence on continuous loop and in our autoplay feed, often with no context whatsoever, we can experience some vicarious trauma or the sense that our neighborhoods and communities are unsafe, that violent crime rates are increasing when in fact they're decreasing, that our risk of violent victimization is greater than it actually is, and that the world is a dangerous place. Some people actually profit from the fear and anxiety that this creates. But what's good for them is bad for us, for we get depressed, we become cynical, and we get angry. Incessantly bombarded with the sights, sounds, and emotions of shootings, stabbings, and sexual assaults, we can become desensitized to such acts, for they become normal. Or worse, we learn to think of them as a viable solution to life's problems. It is true that some people are inspired by the violence that they see online. This creates a snowball or copycat effect where people act out violence in patterns similar to which they see. And oh, do they see. This year, in Christchurch, New Zealand, 50 people killed in two mosques by a terrorist inspired by another extremist who had killed 77 people in Oslo, Norway. The difference was that the individual in New Zealand live streamed the entire event to Facebook from a head-mounted GoPro camera. Propaganda by the deed. And it's true that the words and deeds of terrorists and mass shooters, for some people, hold deep meaning. Their manifestos spread like wildfire to the darkest corners of the internet, where they can inspire new ideologies and subcultures, such as the misogynistic involuntary celibate or incel rebellion, which has claimed far too many lives in the name of hate. Now, of course, hate predates the internet. But before 4chan and 8chan and Reddit and Gab, it lived a half-life on the fringes of society. Social media has made old hatreds new again. It has encouraged jihadists to recruit by posting videotaped decapitations, and it has enabled lone wolves to find their path. Our theme here today is to ignite, to transform. Well, it's clear that social media has transformed our relationship with violence, but that's not necessarily always a bad thing. As the Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis famously said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. The upside of the internet is that it's making the once unseen seen, and therefore it is exposing violence at its source. This is empowering the survivors of violence to finally share their stories, and it's mobilizing movements from Me Too to Black Lives Matter to March for Our Lives, who are holding institutions accountable for legacies of systemic and structural violence. The threat of going viral on YouTube is forcing everyone, 
from police officers to politicians to rethink their behaviors, to think before they act. And a time and date stamped report of an incident posted online is making it harder to explain that away, something that sexual violence survivors have routinely encountered in the past. Every violent image posted online leaves a digital fingerprint. Right now, law enforcement and social service providers are monitoring the internet to ensure that escalating tensions between rival gangs uh, don't uh, sort of devolve into gunshots exchanged on the streets. But we can and we must do more. It starts with Silicon Valley taking responsibility. Right now, the technology is too slow to react and tech companies are too afraid to admit that they might be complicit in the harm that we see. By creating these platforms, they are more than just enabling violent performances, they're actively participating in them. Worse, they might be profiting from them. If live streaming cannot be sufficiently monitored and regulated, why subject us to live streaming? If we can time delay the Oscars, to mute the profanity of celebrities? Why can't visual recognition algorithms immediately hash the violence to silence the persuasions of terrorists? If Netflix knows which movies I'd like to watch next, then surely deep learning algorithms can watch for signs when people wish to do themselves and others grievous harm and get them connected to the services that they need. Of course, we can't leave this exclusively to the computer scientists. An algorithm is only as good as its trainer. Deep learning is only as good as its data, which is why we need researchers, practitioners, advocates, and above all, young people who better than anybody understand the etiquette and speak the language of social media so we can create dynamic, culturally responsive, fair and equitable AI systems. Through media literacy, we need to change being bystanders to become upstanders, to support and embrace the survivors of violence, and to hold the perpetrators accountable. In the end, performances close their curtains when people stop buying tickets. We must not glorify the actions of violent offenders and revel in the misfortune of others. Starve the, heroin, uh, the terrorists, hate groups, mass shooters, and gang members of the oxygen of publicity that they desire. Be careful what you like and what you retweet. Remember, your attention is your power. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention because when we lead, no one has to bleed. Thank you.